Welcome to the PAL seminar. Uh, this is February 21. Today's speaker is Zarathustra Brady, and he will speak on simplifying clones with partial semi-lattice operations. Zed? All right. Thanks for inviting me. Um, so this talk is mostly a way to evangelize a technique I learned from Andrei Bulatov's papers. Um, and I think it's a really beautiful technique as, as simple as this unary iteration, which I'm going to start by uh, re reviewing. So unary iteration is uh, something you can do to a one variable function. Um, so suppose we've got some one variable function on a finite set. I'm going to use this notation f circ n for f composed n times. Um, and the basic fact is there's some finite m so that uh, composing f m times and compo composing f k m times is the same for all k. So if you haven't seen this before, then it's a very fun exercise. I expect most of the people on this call have seen this before. Um, and then I'm going to make this definition based on the fact on the previous slide. Um, f composed infinitely many times is the pointwise limit of f composed n factorial times as n goes to infinity. Um, I considered writing f composed infinity factorial, but the notation was just getting too long. OK, and the point is that this limit is going to be the same as this f composed m for that particular m in the proposition. OK. And uh, the magic is for any f, this f infinity satisfies f infinity of f infinity is f infinity. And uh, just a definition, if you have a unary function that satisfies e of e of x is e of x, I'm going to call it compositionally idempotent to distinguish it from the other meaning of idempotent operation, which comes up. OK. Now, I want to emphasize that this uh, unary iteration taking f to f infinity is really nice and that is compatible with homomorphisms. If I have a homomorphism from uh, unary algebra a f to b g, then the same homomorphism works from a f infinity to b g infinity. And uh, it's also compatible with finite products. So you could say this f infinity is um, an implicit operation in uh, the language of uh, Yen Reiterman uh, about a way to describe pseudo varieties in terms of implicit operations, or you can just say it has these nice functorial properties. Another really nice property is uh, this f infinity can be computed from f in linear time. If you give me the input output table for f, I can compute f infinity in about the same amount of time as it takes to read the description of f. All right, and then how do we use these? Um, so if I've got some compositionally idempotent e and I've got some higher arity f, then I can define this f sub e, where I take all the inputs, apply e to them, apply f to the result, and apply e to the result of that. Now, I don't actually need to apply e to the inside things. I just like to do this because it makes it clear that all I care about is the restriction of f to the outputs of e. And once I do this, I see that, um, so this f e is in the clone generated by e and f. And f e is basically just a function from e, a, e of a to the nth power to e of a. So, I mean, really it's a function from a to the n to e of a, but the values on the rest of a, a to the n are completely determined by the values of, on e, e a to the n. All right, and there's this very nice property. If I have some height one identity, f of x1 through xn is g of y1 through yn, and I apply this uh, to both f and g to get f sub e and g sub e, then I get the same height one identity. 
Uh, and here I wrote x1 through xn. I don't mean that all these variables are distinct, like x1 might equal x3. Um, OK. So this map that takes takes as input a, a general function f and produces as output function fe preserves identities of height at most one, and it shrinks the domain. OK. And uh, if we're studying identities of height one, which we tend to study in applications to constraint satisfaction problems, we can replace our original algebra A by this algebra A sub E, whose domain is E applied to A, and whose functions are F sub E for every F in the clone of A. And uh, you know the functions are in no particular order. And we can do this for, for any E, uh, which is compositionally idempotent. Uh, and we don't really need this idempotent assumption, but it makes it easier to understand exactly what's going on. We're just crushing A into this set. Eventually, if we keep on applying this construction, we reduce to the case where for every unary F in the clone, F infinity of X is just X. And in that case, the the unary operations in the clone form a group. All right, and then uh, in the case where the unary operations of the clone form a group, then the associated relational structure that we study in the constraint satisfaction problem is called a core. And this is how we reduce general CSPs to cores, okay. And then uh, I just wanted to review really quickly, then uh, there's a corresponding reduction to idempotent algebras which is uh, if these unary operations form a group, then every function can be decomposed into a unary part and an idempotent part. Or the unary part is you just uh, plug in all of the inputs are the same. And the idempotent part, you just take the original function and you undo the unary part. And the fact that you can do that is because all the unary operations are invertible. And uh, if you have a height one identity and the uh, original clone, then the idempotent parts satisfy the same identity. Okay. So the goal of this talk is to generalize the unary iteration construction to binary operations. All right. And we want to. Uh, not generalize it in a random way, we actually want it to be useful. So what we're going to do is we're going to start from uh, a two variable function. We're going to construct another two variable function S and the clone of T, which satisfies these identities. S of X comma SXY is S of SXY comma X is S of XY. Uh, And uh, whoop. Um, okay. So these identities are, I think, a bit stronger than what people usually do when they try to generalize uh, unary iteration to a binary function. And I'm going to call an S satisfying these identities a partial semi lattice operation. So Andre Bulatov's the first person to introduce such operations. He currently calls these identities the semi lattice shift condition. Um, and previously, I think it didn't have a name. So we will use these partial semi lattice operations S to simplify our clones while preserving some, but not all, height one identities. And this is sort of analogous to what we did with the unary operations. And when no further simplifications of this sort are possible, the application is that binary absorption will suddenly have very nice properties. Okay. So first, I wanna start with the first bullet point. We have to, or second bullet point, I'm going to show you how to construct an S satisfying these strong looking identities. All right, so the first step is I'm going to do the usual generalization. I'm going to take my, my, two, my two variable function t and I'm going to treat it as a one variable function where the first input is a parameter and the second input is the thing that I act on. 
and I'm going to define this T circ two of N, which means I'm composing on the second argument to just be T of X comma T of X dot 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 T, T X Y. And then exactly analogously to the unary case, I define this T to infinity X, Y is the limit of this T to N factorial X, Y. And same argument as the unary case, or even just an application of the unary case, we automatically have this T to infinity X, T to infinity X, Y is always equal to T to infinity X, Y. All right, and usually people stop here. Now, here's the clever part. And this, uh, this idea what I found in one of Andre Bulatov's paper. Suppose you start with an idempotent binary function. So uh, in case it's not clear, I always assume that we've already done the trick with the unary iteration to reduce to studying only idempotent algebras. So all the functions from here on are idempotent. So anyway, suppose we've, we've got some idempotent binary function f, which satisfies this identity fx comma fxy is fxy that we get by during the iteration on the previous slide. Now we're going to do something a little bit surprising. I'm going to find this two variable function u, x, uxy by fx comma fyx. And this doesn't, it's not obvious to me at all that this should help us towards our goal. You know, it seems completely unrelated to the identities that we, uh, we started with. But this will satisfy one of the identities that we were trying to get with the partial semi-lattice operation. So the argument goes like this. By our assumption on F, um, and the fact that u x y can be written as f of x comma something, we have f of x comma u x y is u x y. Uh, let me see if I can just write something really quickly to say why this is the case. So oh, let's try a different color. There we go. So this here is equal to fx, just really making this explicit, fx, fyx. And now we just use our identity on f to sort of collapse the beginning part. This is just f x f y x, which is u again. Okay, so that's uh, the proof of this first little bit. Uh, now let me erase this. All right, there we go. All right, I am struggling with the interface. Give me a second. Nope. There we go. Okay, sorry about that. All right. So since fx uxy is uxy, now if we plug in u of uxy x and we just expand out what the outer u is, then this is f of uxy comma f x uxy. Um, this is a little bit confusing. The Oops. This x here turned into this x there, um, just like this y here turned into that y there. Okay. Um, and then we we use we use this fact here, replace this with that, and now we use f as idempotent. We get back u x y. All right, so we started with something satisfying this first identity, 
that we got by an iteration, and we get something satisfying the second identity, but probably no longer satisfying the first identity. So it's not clear that we've made any progress. So here's the second bit of magic. I think this is a little bit of a miracle. Suppose we have this two variable function that satisfies the second identity here. Then I'm going to directly jump to, so, you know, spoiler, we directly jump to this partial semi lattice operation just by again iterating this two variable operation u on its second variable. Checking that this works is a little bit tricky. So, first thing to do is we check that for every n, we have u composed on its second argument n times uh, applied to ux, y, x is ux, y. So why is this? Well, we think of this first input ux, y as a parameter, and we're applying this to x over and over. So the first time we apply u to ux, y, and x, we get ux, y. The second time we apply u to ux, y, and ux, y. And even if we didn't make the assumption that u is idempotent, you can check that this implies that u of uxy, uxy is uxy. But since we're assuming everything is idempotent, we just get it immediately in one step. So the, the sort of picture is that x gets mapped to uxy, and then uxy gets mapped to uxy. Okay. All right, this is not quite what we want. So now I replace y by u applied n minus one times to x and y. And this identity and we get u composed on the second argument n times of u composed on the second argument n times of x, y applied to x u composed to n times on the second argument of x, y. So this is the same identity that you satisfied. So u to n satisfies the same thing you did for every n. Now we just take this pointwise limit and we immediately get that s satisfies this same identity as u. And since s was defined as this, uh, limit on, of iterating on the second variable, it also satisfies this other identity. And that's it, that's the whole construction. So just to recap the whole thing in one slide, our construction is we started with T, which I'm going to assume is idempotent. We iterate T on its second argument until it repeats itself and we get this fxy. Then we plug it into itself in this surprising way, fx comma fyx to get u, and then we take u and iterate that on its second argument, we get s. So more compactly, all in one line, uh, not obvious to me whether this notation is readable, but I, took t, I iterated it, I plugged in pi 2, pi 1, and took t, iterated that, plugged in pi 1, and then this thing, and then this whole operation got composed on its second argument. All right, so that's the construction. And it inherits the nice behavior of unary iteration. So suppose I've got two operations, t1, t2, and they map to s1, s2 by the procedure I just went through. So this construction is compatible with homomorphisms. If I've got an algebra A1, T1, I have a homomorphism to A2, T2, and I apply this construction, get A1, S1, A2, S2, the same homomorphism works. And the reason is just, I built this out of unary iteration and composition. Both of those are sort of functorial in this way. So this construction is also functorial in that way. Construction is also compatible with finite products. And as a bonus, the uh, 
these partial semi-lattice operations SI can be computed from TI in time uh, AI squared, which is, you know, in, that's the time it takes to write down the function TI. So this is sort of as mu much as you could hope for from a construction other than, you know, being a, a li literally a term. Okay. Um, now, so far, it's not clear that the function S is non-trivial in any way. So here comes binary absorption. Suppose that this operation T that we started with witnesses some binary absorption. What that means is that for some C contained in some set B contained in A, whenever one of the inputs is in B, uh, is in C and the other input could be anything in B, then the output is also in C. So this is the definition of C absorbing B with respect to T. Now, if we apply our binary, binary iteration procedure to get a partial semi-lattice term S, then S will automatically satisfy the same thing. S of, if one of the inputs of S is in C and the other is in B, then the output will be in C. And the reason is just in our construction of S from T, both variables showed up. As long as that happens, um, if T binary uh, witnesses a binary absorption, S will witness the same binary absorption. So in particular, if B and C are different, then S must be non-trivial. And then there's one case, the main case where we use this is the case where B has two elements and C has one element. So that is uh, if T of A, B equals T of B, A equals B, then S, A, B equals S, B, A equals B. Now, remember, I'm assuming everywhere here that T is idempotent. So if you don't make the assumption that T is idempotent, uh, this implication might not work. All right. Now, I also want to say uh, what these identities mean. So they're not just random identities. Well, obviously, but they also have some sort of clear intuitive meaning. So the meaning is, together with idempotence, which I've been assuming in the background this whole time, these identities are equivalent to saying that for any x and y, the set x comma sxy with the operation s forms a, two, a one or two element semi-lattice with absorbing element sxy and neutral element x. So I like to use this notation. A sort of gets absorbed by B under S when A comma B with the operation S forms a semi-lattice with absorbing element S. Uh, and this notation is inspired by Andrei Bulatov's um, directed semi-lattice edges and his graph he attaches to algebras. So, you know, I draw the edge. And uh, some equivalent conditions for this are, uh, you know, A, B, S makes a semi-lattice with absorbing element B is equivalent to just S, A, B equals B, which is very compact. And that's also equivalent to the existence of some things that S, A, C equals B. Okay. Now, uh, I promised that I would simplify clones for you. So suppose we've got some A, which has a, a semi-lattice edge to, to B under S. We would like to accomplish two things. First, we would like for the set AB to actually be a subalgebra. Second, we would like for this subalgebra to be term equivalent to this two element semi-lattice AB comma S. So we want, so of course, in general, this doesn't happen. So what we want to do is to find a reduct of A, which satisfies these properties, and which preserves as many of the height one identities satisfied by A as possible. And uh, yeah, so we can't preserve all height one identities because any height one identity that survives must 
be possible to satisfy an assignment like this. Okay, so I don't have a complete classification of what height one identities can be preserved. I just have a few sufficient conditions. So the first one is two variable height one identities where the both variables appear on both sides. So in, to facilitate the construction, I'm going to define some n-ary operations, which act like the n-ary semi-lattice. So I define these by induction. Um, so the S1 of X is just X. And then from there on, they're defined by Sn of X. You first take the N minus one area thing and you apply with S to combine it with S of X1, Xn. So X1, Xn, this is something that X has a semi-lattice edge to. And this is some combination of things that X has a semi-lattice edge to, and then we apply S. So it's not completely clear right away what will happen if we apply this. So here's the fact. If our X1 is just X, and if the set of all the variables I'm plugging in is a two, a two element set X, Y, then the output is always the same as S of X, Y. So this we prove by induction. Let me quickly sketch out the inductive proof. So uh, if n equals one, um, well, it's vacuously true. Um, and let's see, n more than one. Um, so then we have some cases. So the cases are either x1 through xn minus one could just be x. So in that case, um, you know, this thing here is just gonna be x. So we're going to get s of x, s of x, and then xn has to be y. And that is SXY. The other case if X1 through XN minus one is XY, then by the induction hypothesis, we get, now let's erase this. Uh, by the induction hypothesis, we get in the first input SXY, and in the second input X or SXY. And in, if we put the X here, we get SXY. And if we put SXY here, then item put in safe less. Okay, so that is the proof that this construction uh, has the claimed properties. All right, uh, I only know how to do this in this two variable case. If someone can find a way to do the same thing for three variables, I uh, will be very happy. All right. So now I'm going to show how to use, oh, whoops, I made a little mistake here. Uh, there should be little ends on all of these. Okay. So for any function, I'm going to sort of pre-process its inputs. I'm going to replace x1 with S of X1 through Xn. I'm gonna replace X2 with S of X2 through X1, and so on. And what will happen is if I plug in something like, let's say I plug in like X, Y, X. So by this property that Sn has, this will come out to F of S, X, Y first, and then the next one starts with a Y. So I will get S, Y, X. And then the third one, I get S, X, Y. And you see every X got turned into an X, Y, and every Y got turned into a Y, X. So I am applying the original function F to the same pattern of variables, just 
X is replaced by S X Y's and Y's replaced by X S Y X's. So I conclu conclude that if I had a height one I identity in the beginning, and if the variables occurring on the left are the set X Y and the variables occurring on the right form the set X Y, then if I make this uh, I replace F with FS and G with GS, the same identity still holds. All right, so I'm going to apply this construction to every operation in my clone. So unlike the unary case, I'm not also shrinking the domain. And uh, if A is absorbed by B with respect to S, then now a comma b becomes a subalgebra of as just because when we did this pre-processing um, sn applied to anything containing only a's and b's will produce b if any of them are b's and uh, the subalgebra will be a equi term equivalent to this two element semi lattice uh, additionally Every system of two variable height one identities with both variables occurring on each side, which was satisfied in A, is also going to be satisfied in A sub S. So in particular, we have two special cases of varieties defined by systems of two variable height one identities with both variables on each side. And these are, if A is Taylor, then A sub S is Taylor. And if A has bounded width, then A sub S has bounded width. And for people who are more pure algebraists, this is equivalent to being congru congruence meet semi-distributive. Okay. Uh, the same thing doesn't work for congruence modularity just because semi-lattices are not congruence modular. All right, so here's another case I can handle, symmetric operations. So an operation is symmetric if every way of permuting its inputs leaves the value unchanged. Uh, an algebra has symmetric operations of every arity if and only if the linear programming relaxation solves the CSP. Now here is a construction, again, using the same functions SN as before. Uh, we take our inputs x1 through xn. I'm going to plug in every single permutation of x1 through xn to my nary functions sn. And that gives me n factorial different things. And I'm going to apply f sub n factorial to them. So this construction really relies on having every single symmetric operation. I'm using the n factorial array operation to construct the n array operation of my smaller clone. So each one of these F sub N S is symmetric. And if I have a semi lattice edge from A to B, then F N S acts as the symmetric semi lattice operation on the set A B. All right, one more case I can handle, totally symmetric operations. So totally symmetric is not the same as having the full symmetric group of symmetries. It's stronger. It means that as long as the very the set of variables occurring on each side are the same, the two sides are equal. So for instance, a totally symmetric operation has to satisfy this identity as well, which is not implied by symmetry. Okay. And an algebra has totally symmetric operations of every arity, if and only if arc consistency solves this DSP. And there's an example of an algebra which has symmetric of every arity, but does not have totally symmetric of every arity. So here's the result. If you have totally symmetric operations of every arity, then there's a construction more complicated than before. I'm gonna use the same notation, F sub N S. So if I have a semi last edge from A to B, then F sub N S acts like SN on the set AB. 
uh, I'm not going to prove this here. The proof is actually surprisingly intricate. Uh, but it's the sort of thing that could make a good exercise. OK. All right, so I've gave, given some constructions that all involve pre-processing pre inputs to functions f by applying these operations Sn, and they preserve certain types of height one identities. So I'm going to give a definition, which I think of as sort of an analog of idempotence when you're studying uh, algebras where semi-lattices are allowed and you're studying these height one identities, I find it's uh, almost always useful to make this additional assumption. So I say an algebra is prepared if whenever the pair BB can be generated by the pairs AB and BA, then the set AB is a subalgebra, which is term equivalent to a semi-lattice with absorbing element B and neutral element A. So this is to me, you know, like first you assume idempotence that makes a lot of things simpler. The second assumption makes things significantly simpler. And uh, if my algebra A is prepared, then I write A has an arrow to B if this situation occurs. If AB makes a two element semi lattice with absorbing element B. All right. So now I want to tell you about how you can use this to improve binary absorption. All right, so I'm going to write uh, B binary absorbs A. If there's a binary term T, so that B absorbs A with respect to T. This was something I went over a little bit before. There's another version of absorption, which is much stronger, called strong absorption. So B strongly absorbs A. If for every function in the clone, which depends on its first variable, um, if you plug in something with the first variable in B, then the output is always in B. All right. So as long as your algebra is not completely trivial, um, if B strongly absorbs A, then B automatically binary absorbs A. Just pick any operation that depends on both variables, apply the definition of strong absorption to f of x, y, and f of y, x, and you see that f has to witness binary absorption. So it would be really nice if we had a converse. So I'll say that an algebra A has been strongly prepared. If every time you have any binary absorption, it automatically becomes strong absorption. And I'll just state this next fact without proving it. So the previous constructions I used before can also be used to reduce to the case where algebra A is strongly prepared. Now, I often won't need the full power of this just being prepared as F. By the way, if anyone has a better word than prepared for this, I'm willing to change the, the words I use. All right, so let me demonstrate some problems with binary absorption in the general case. First, transitivity. Suppose B is a binary absorbing algebra of subalgebra of A and C is a binary absorbing subalgebra of B. Does it follow that C is a binary absor absorbing subalgebra of A? Seems like if you have like a concept that you want to do things with, this sort of property would be really nice. Unfortunately, it's not true. We have the simplest counterexample. Um, just consider this four element lattice. So at the bottom I have zero, zero, at the top I have one, one, here I have zero, one, here I have one, zero. All right, so this lattice is absorbed by the subalgebra zero, zero, and zero, one. And the absorbing operation is the meat. You take the meat of, some, of anything with something in here, you end up in here. Now this subalgebra, is binary absorbed by its top element with the absorbing operation being the joint. But the entire algebra can't be absorbed by this uh, subalgebra C because any absorbing operation would have to take one zero comma zero one to zero one and vice versa. And just a symmetry argument shows that's impossible. So, 
we completely fail with the simplest example to have transitivity of binary absorption. Well, maybe binary absorption wasn't the right concept. How about strong absorption? That also fails. So here there's a three element algebra. Uh, the directed graph of semi-lattice edges looks like this. And this algebra is just got one commutative operation. Um, the edge from A to B tells you that A times B is B. The edge from B to C tells you that B times C is C. And A times C is B. Then you can just check uh, by brute force that the set BC is a strongly absorbing subalgebra. And the set C is a strongly absorbing subalgebra of BC. But C is not strongly absorbing because A times C is not C. <laughs> Okay, so binary absorption isn't transitive. Strong absorption isn't transitive. I've tried many variations of these concepts and I can't find anyone which is uh, transitively closed other than you know the transitive closure of strong absorption, whatever that is. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm gonna show you that in a prepared algebra, we actually get transitivity. First, I need one little lemma about absorption. If I've got one of these prepared algebras, and if I have an absorbing subalgebra of A, so absorbing could have any arity, um, but if you aren't familiar with the definition, just think of binary absorption. Then for any partial semi-lattice operation S, if I put the first input in B, the output is in B. So sort of like a tiny piece of strong absorption. All right, the proof of this lemma is not very hard. Suppose we've got some element of B and I've got this semi-lattice edge SB. Uh, so let's draw, here's B, here I've got A, here I've got B and B has a semi-lattice edge to SBA. And suppose that this SBA is outside of B. Well, B and SBA, they form a little semi-lattice subalgebra with absorbing element SBA and neutral element B. But B is the intersection of an absorbing subalgebra with this two element algebra. So this neutral element has to be absorbing in this two element semi-lattice. That's impossible, so this can't happen. So conclusion is SBA has to be an element of B. This can't ever occur. So that's the whole argument. Any absorbing subalgebra, no semi-lattice edges can leave it. Uh, you can you can generalize this a little bit, but uh, this is all I'll need for this talk. So let's say we have a prepared algebra. Now I can prove transitivity. If C binary absorbs B, and if B binary absorbs A, then C will binary absorb A. The proof by construction. So first, I use the fact that C binary absorbs B and I take whatever binary operation witnessed that and I apply my iteration rule to get this partial semi-lattice term S that also witnesses the binary absorption. And then I lazily take any binary term T witnessing B binary absorbing A. Now I make this construction. We find this two variable operation U by this thing. So I'm gonna claim that U witnesses binary absorption of C and A. Let's see if we can trace through. Let's consider the case where X is in A and Y is in C. And we have to check that the output is in C. So uh, T of X, Y, well, X is in A, Y is in C, which is in B. So T of X, Y is gonna be in B because T witnessed B binary absorbing A. Then this 
S applied to an element of B and anything is going to be, oh, actually, whoops, this first one, I have an element of B and something in C. So I get to apply uh, my assumption about S to see that this is in C. All right, the second part, once again, T witnesses B absorbing A, so T of Y, X is in B. And now X is just in A, but I can use that fact that there are no semi-lattice edges leaving B to see that S of B and X, this is also in B. And now I've got a situation where I've got an element of C and an element of B. So by assumption on S, this is in C. And if you switch the roles of X and Y, what happens is the argument I used for the left part becomes an argument I use for the right part and vice versa. And then I use the fact that S of B, C is in C. Okay, so that is the, uh, the proof for this. Okay. Another nice little fact, if I've got a prepared algebra, then every absorbing subalgebra inter intersects with every binary absorbing subalgebra. So this is not true in general. For instance, if you have a two element lattice, uh, zero, one, Zero is a binary absorbing subalgebra, one is a binary absorbing subalgebra, and they do not intersect. But this algebra is not prepared. So once we prepare it, uh, the binary absorbing subalgebras will intersect every absorbing subalgebra. How do we prove it? Well, I'm going to pick some partial semi lattice term that witnesses that B2 binary absorbs A. And I will apply this partial semi-lattice term to any element of B1 and any element of B2. Since there are no semi-lattice edges leaving an absorbing subalgebra, the result is in B1. And since uh, B2 absorbed A with respect to S, the result is also in B2. There you go. Okay, and then just one more cool fact about binary absorption and prepared algebras. If I've got a prepared algebra, and if B is a subset, a subalgebra of A, which is closed under semi-lattice edges. So this SBA is contained in B means that no semi-lattice edge leaves B. In this case, the following are equivalent. B binary absorbs A. For every element outside B, for every element of B, the subalgebra they generate has a proper absorbing subalgebra. For every element outside B and every element of B, the subalgebra they generate has a directed path from A into the set B. And for every element outside B and every element in B, there's a directed path of length one from A into B in the subalgebra they generate. All right, this one, the proof is a little bit intricate, but elementary sort of. So I will leave this as a intriguing exercise and end my talk here. Thank you for your attention.